sing. Are you okay? Let's have a cheer. Yeah, I know it's early. I've actually been up since four o'clock. So I'm kind of half, halfway through the day already. So I'm so excited to be here. I've been wanting to speak uh, at this event for quite a few years. This is actually my first speaking gig in the US as well. I've been speaking a lot in Europe and other places, uh, but this is my first um, US slot. So uh, hopefully you can understand my accent okay. Uh, I'm actually Norwegian, but I've lived in the UK for uh, nearly 18 years, which make my accent sound like a drunk Irish person. Um, so I'm going to be talking about how to get big links, um, but first I need to just tell you a story. In January 2015, my agency weren't, wasn't doing too well. So I run an SEO agency, SEO only, and the results that we were managing to receive, especially uh, in terms of link building, were rapidly decreasing. In fact, we were kind of staring down the barrel. The amount of time that it took to get one piece of coverage and the quality of that coverage was reducing. So I had a choice to make. I could continue along the same way and hope for the best, or I could take a risk and restructure. I think one of the big problems was that by then, there had been so many algorithm changes, particularly to do with uh, link quality and the type of content that was coming out, because by this time, everyone was trying to do content marketing, which I think 80% of the time meant writing articles or very static infographics and such. It was so much of that content out there that standing out became really quite difficult. So I realized that if I continued creating one piece of content in the hope of getting one link, that link would have to be really, really good. So I restructured the agency, and the way the agency now looks is more like a creative agency. So we have designers, developers, researchers, copywriters, um, creatives, and tech SEO. But the biggest part is the outreach team. So basically, what I did was restructure in this way because I really believed that to survive, <laughs> We had to start thinking like 50s ad execs and executing like geeks. We have launched 12, um, 66 campaigns in the last 12 months. That's a lot of campaigns over several markets. But of those 66 campaigns, we came up with 350 ideas. In fact, way over that. What does that say about us? We're really good at coming up with shit ideas. Oh, let me give you some examples. <laughs> so, have you ever thought it would be really cool if you could print your tweet on a toast? A toaster? Yeah, that's not really great. <laughs> or, it gets worse. <laughs> have you ever thought, how cool would it be, or handy would it be, if you could order a condom with your pizza? <laughs> I really fear that this was one of my ideas as well. <laughs> The point is, you have to come up with a lot of shit ideas in order to come up with great ideas. And it's pretty much about not being afraid to fail. I know it's a lot of pressure of being original, coming up with content. And when we think about creatives, we think about people like P Picasso or Edison or Steve Jobs, maybe. And we don't really see our ourselves like that. And then we panic, and it kind of becomes a 404 of creativity not found. The problem is that we don't really need to be thinking we need to be creative or a creative. I think it's about being innovative. And to me, being innovative is simply to take something and make it better. So, when Aliens was pitched into the Hollywood studios, it was actually pitched in as Jaws in space. And if you think about it, Grubhub is kind of like Uber for food. Find something that nearly worked and make it better. 
So in uh, 1982, a, um, a Austrian uh, named, oh, mind this name, Dietrich Masterschitz, that is definitely not how you pronounce it. Uh, he visited Thailand and he came across an energy drink that was marketed to, um, to truckers, really low cost energy drink. And as you can see, he didn't really even bother changing the logo. This is now Red Bull, one of the most successful drink stories, I think, of the time. So in 2013, Business Insider did this uh, piece called um, this piece about 100 deadliest films by on-screen deaths. This was definitely a data geek geeking out. Um, and it was an interesting piece, but it looked pretty terrible, right? And it shows you uh, basically the 100 top movies uh, with, and then according to how many on-screen deaths there was. So we took this piece and realized we could make it better visually, but also from the data point of view. So we created uh, what became Director's Cut, which is basically an updated version of this campaign, um, which, you know, you'd be amazed at how much data you can find accessible. There was an entire forum dedicated to counting on-screen deaths. <laughs> Amazing. Um, so this is what it looked like. Uh, very importantly, the top movie was quite a big surprise. Guardian of the Galaxy, a PG-13, was the deadliest movie of all time. So I must admit that this campaign surprised me how well it did. The first paper to pick it up was The Guardian, so The Guardian in the UK is one of the most respected newspapers. And as soon as The Guardian covered it, we had a tweet from James Gunn, which is the director of Guardians of the Galaxy, going, yay, deadliest movie. Not only did he tweet it, he spent two hours replying to tweets saying, no, I think you will find this is correct data. Because I bet you a few of you are now thinking, surely, Star Wars blowing up planets were more deaths. This is the point of it. If the result is surprising, it, it creates discussion. And creating discussion is the surefire thing of managing to get the coverage. This got over 700 links. And of the biggest majority of these links are seriously high authority. Yahoo, The Guardian, Enemy, CBS. It just got loads and loads. And that's not the only thing you got. I think it's important to try to concentrate on getting coverage that also deserves more than just the link. This became a Twitter moment shared over 48,000 times in 48 hours. Social might not be an impact on rankings, but it sure as hell helps you get links. Another campaign we did, which was based on something that already exists, is the Forbes uh, billionaires list, which I'm sure um, you all would have seen at some point. Um, this is a, a list that's uh, released every year by Forbes and it has several decades of data. The interesting thing is that they have this list and they have like, you can go back to the older versions, but there's no way of seeing all of this data in one. So we created the Billionaires League, where we, where we got all the data from Forbes, but also added other additional research pieces, um, more lighthearted angles. And this basically allows you to, um, to, to go out and do outreach for loads of different angles, like has the average age of billionaires gone up or down? Um, it also had, um, had several, sorry, it also had um, female billionaires included in it. And this got 97 links and over 850,000 views. If your coverage can get that amount of views, it is very unlikely that it's going to be deemed as dodgy in any way from Google's point of view. I had a bit of an order issue with the slides, sorry. I also would really recommend that you over-invest in building formats that can be used again. And again, going, to, going back to movies for inspiration here, um, Finding Nemo, um, when they created that, they had to create a new ray tracing technology to model the light dappling through the water. That took an extortionate amount of time for Pixar. But this is something that Pixar is known for doing. They've got something called the Pixar Render Man, which is basically a library of technology that once they've created this technology, they can use it for the next movie and the next movie. 
obviously our head of production is not too pleased about this because sometimes it takes an awful lot of time um, to add uh, a piece of new technology or, um, or spend extra time on a campaign. But this year, we launched this campaign, which is the eSports Champions, looking at all different data points about the eSports industry. And as you can see, it's pretty much Billionaires League for eSports. So putting in that extra time on um, Billionaires League helped us create another campaign quite quickly. This looks at things like top earning women in the industry, um, how much price money. It literally had like at least 40 different entry points of data that you can look into the eSports. And it's like, I think this is just a super interesting um, kind of uh, industry to look into. And it's so hot. And it's already had 198 uh, links. And that is a quite recent campaign as well. And 190,000 views uh, picked up by MSN Business Insider Mashable. This campaign was done uh, pan um, Nordic. So all the Nordic countries, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Finland. Um, and it got a lot of coverage also in those uh, countries, which is very, very challenging because there are a lot of laws around um, uh, gambling sites and stuff, and this was for a gambling client. Another idea that's worked really well for us is um, we quite like collaborating, and again, this takes a lot of time the first time around. Um, in Sweden, for Expedia, we worked with a castle called Malmöhus Slot, um, where we created a Google Street View tour um, of the castle with uh, audiovisual as well and um, information about each area in the castle. Now, to be able to do this, we had to create a new software that helped uh, doing street view over several floors. It took us a lot of time, but it then allowed us to look at other venues that we could do similar things with. This had 86 uh, links and 25,000 views. Obviously, this is the, uh, in Sweden, so Swedish market is a lot smaller in terms of the amount of sites and stuff. Um, and for Expedia being a travel company, getting visit Sweden and the very specific travel-related sites is very big. So this year, we launched um, the, the prison, which is basically a museum of a prison in Co uh, near Copenhagen in Denmark, where we use the exact same technology again uh, and we're able to create street view in this, uh, this prison. This is a very recent campaign. It's already got 83 links. And as you see again, there's a lot of very travel-related sites there, like literally nearly every tourist board, local, as well as the Danish tourist board, the main one, uh, covered this piece. So I'm not saying that that means the developers can then just chill out. You have to continuously work at this. Um, but it's not always a data piece or programming where you need to uh, invest in. Sometimes it can be really plain and really simple. We launched this uh, end of last year for Expedia in the UK, uh, and it's a very simple a graphic campaign. Um, it's a kind of travel posters created in a vintage style, uh, including extinct animals from around the world like they were still alive. So the dodo in Mauritius and the, the um, moa in New Zealand and so on. These are very, very pretty, but they're also for a very good cause, right? And this did amazingly well. It got over 223 links, including, again, some of the biggest sites out there. This got a lot of US coverage as well. This also picked up loads of social shares from all of those sites that uh, featured it. And it got covered in the Observer on Sunday. Uh, Observer is the second biggest Sunday newspaper in the UK. So getting print coverage with your SEO campaign, I think, isn't the standard. But if it's good enough to be in the paper, again, it is going to reduce the risk um, uh, going forward. One of my favorite things about this campaign is that it was even made into a, fad, um, a fan made mod for The Sims game. So you can actually see the poster in the game. That's some serious dedication. It must have really spoken to someone to take that time, and I love that. Uh, people started calling our office wanting to buy the posters. And lastly, and most impressively, I think, is someone started a petition thanking the managing director of Expedia UK for commissioning this work. When was the last time you saw a petition where someone was thanking someone? It's crazy. The main thing with this, though, is that doing creative campaigns 
for SEO to get links, it's not good enough that you get one campaign and that does well. You have to consistently get the coverage. And when you get the consistent coverage, that's when you get the results. Because that is what you want to know, right? You're like, yeah, this is cool, but does it actually, does it actually work? So we worked with Expedia for four years. Um, we only worked with Expedia in Europe. Just want to make that clear. Um, and uh, in the last 12 months, we've had 46% increase in organic visibility for the Nordic countries. So that's uh, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and Finland. Um, Expedia Sweden having the smallest, that's 16% uh, increase in organic visibility. To put into context, Expedia Sweden has a higher visibility than IKEA in Sweden. So getting any increase is pretty awesome. Uh, another client that we just started working with, Lens Store, which is basically contact lenses online, uh, we've launched two campaigns and four months of outreach so far, and the main hero term of contact lenses have already gone from position 11 to position 3. So it does definitely work. <coughs> so, being SEOs, we really want to know how can we analyze this shit so that we can uh, do exactly the same? I could tell you that we have figured out a way of um, analyzing what type of campaigns work best. So we did that. Uh, this is the last six months uh, worth of campaigns uh, divided into different types like data, games with data capture, visual, street view, video, and so on. But before you go down thinking, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a photo of this, and I'm just going to start doing data campaigns because they work best. I would like to tell you a story about some chickens. I thought that would get love. It's chickens. That's weird. <laughs> OK. So there was a study made uh, at University of Texas at Austin. Um, and it, it, is, it is quite a funny study because they, uh, they had lots of participants to look at these pictures of a plump, attractive chicken. I've never said that, plump, attractive chicken, um, versus an unattractive chicken and skinny. And then they told the participants that the plump one was a natural chicken, and the skinny one was an engineered chicken. They then divided them in two groups and told group one that the natural chicken is healthy but not that tasty. And the engineered chicken is tasty, but not that healthy. Guess what? The other group, they told the opposite too. What was interesting about the, the findings of this study is that both groups preferred the natural chicken. But neither group justified their choice based on how they felt. In fact, what they did is that they used the opposite reason to justify the same decision. We don't actually make these decisions based on these details. We make it on how we feel. That is the point. This is called post hoc rationalization. And as marketers, we do this all the time. And I, I can hear myself doing it. And I'm like, oh, man, I'm, I'm doing this again. The point is, formats are just the vessel of the idea. The creative is what connects with people. It's not whether it was a data piece. Like, if we do this, if we, if we kind of do all this data, we could actually lose out on campaigns that do really well, just because we're trying to make something into a specific format. I'm just going to get some water. So, oh my god, it's not just you around. I can't open it. <laughs> OK, talk amongst yourselves, sorry. So, but, you know, the creative doesn't have much place if you don't do the outreach. Even the best campaign ever won't get any coverage if you don't tell people about it. So this is what I think we are the most well known for in the UK, is doing the outreach. In fact, at the Verb in the Verb team, the outreach team is the biggest. We have two tech SEOs. We're really good at tech SEO. 
But outreach is the really, really big team because this is where most of the work is done. This is where you get the results. I'm going to tell you about what outreach is not about before I tell you what it is about. So I get asked this a lot. This is the first question people ask me when they, they know that we are doing really well in outreach. In fact, Grant insisted that I needed to still include this slide. <laughs> so we use the same tools that most people use. Gorkana and Meltwater are both tools that you can find the contact for the journalist. Um, and, and, and I think Gorkana is amazing, but um, in some of the more obscure countries, Meltwater is a lot better. And we use Busstream because it's awesome, and it helps us make sure that we keep on track on, uh, with everything. And we use Basumo quite a lot for finding inspiration for campaigns or looking at content while it's already there. But these are just tools. You can't build a house by just holding a hammer and building. These are just tools. The second one I would like to say is that there is no optimum way of writing and outreach emails. I get this a lot as well. Surely it's just keep your outreach emails short and snappy with really terrible jokes. <laughs> I'm going to show you an example. So um, James, who I call JC, because I have a tendency to hire lots of people called James. Um, he's one of our, our most amazing outreach people. Now, his style is quite interesting. So this is his outreach email to, uh, to people for the Billionaires League. So he starts off, obviously he's bolded a few things and stuff, and you think, oh, this looks quite long. This is the next bit, and the next bit. And the next bit, and that's it. What the? That's like an essay, right? Surely this doesn't work. This is like, the, like when I saw this outreach email, I was like, there is no way anyone's going to get back to you. It's gone straight in the junk mail. This is the reply from a journalist at the Mirror. You got my attention with this brilliant release. Wish all PRs sent something like this. I've CC'd the money team, because I think it might be something in there for them. This is the coverage. This is the Mirror, one of the biggest papers in the UK. It's not about how many emails that you send either. Unfortunately, there is no pattern in that. Um, JC, again, see now I'm not even calling him James, it's just JC. Um, this is an example of a month where JC sent uh, over 1,000 emails, and it got 20 pieces of coverage. Now, this is Iris, who sent 267 emails and got 23 pieces of content, uh, 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 23 links. Now, basically, they have totally different strategies of getting the exact same result, which I think is super interesting, and I would like you to really think about that. So going back to that year of January 2015, there was something very significant that I also did in that year, and that was the realization that outreach is about people. It's about the mindset that these people have. And I wholeheartedly believe that outreach is about grit. It's about passion and perseverance, especially perseverance. Because if you want to be in outreach and if you want to get those links, you cannot give up. In uh, March last year, I interviewed this guy, Alex. And uh, Alex had a CV that read pretty much like hundreds of other people wanting to get into this industry. He'd uh, been to university, then done a year doing some writing, uh, worked for a couple of newspapers, and so on. But as I was interviewing him, I realized that the thing that really lit him up was when I talked about his interest. And it turns out there was a story there that he didn't even have on his CV. And that was that Alex, being a very very quite posh uh, schoolboy, 
went to this school, which is a, quite a, a well-known school. It looks like Harry Potter school, surely. Um, he is extremely passionate about American football, like super passionate about American football. In fact, he was so frustrated that there were no literature about American football in the UK. So when he was in a, a university, he decided to write his own book about American football. He did this while he was at university, set off time every day to write, and at the end, he didn't just leave it. He went to a publisher and said, I want you to publish this book. He even bypassed the agent, which is like, for anyone that, work, that knows anyone that's tried to publish anything, that's like completely unheard of. He was super quirky, just went like, I'm just gonna go straight to the publisher. And his book is sold at Amazon and in, uh, in, uh, news, um, in bookstores in the UK. Now that is grit. If I'd just looked at his CV and judged him by his CV, I would have completely missed the talent. Because it's how they think that really changes how well they do. So what I then changed is the way that I was asking questions to find these people. So instead of asking the standard CV questions, I started researching loads of different questions that would help me, think, uh, help me figure out how they are thinking about things, whether they're likely to give up. So there's a few ones that I, I use regularly and I'm gonna share with you. Uh, one of them uh, is actually, I read Originals by Adam Grant, who I love, um, and uh, in his book, uh, there was a mention of a study where they tried to figure out what would make someone stay in a job and also perform in a job. So they asked them like loads and loads of questions. But very frustrating, although it had like 35,000 people um, that they asked, they couldn't find any correlation between like, you know, the obvious things that you would think like uh, education, um, job hopping or anything like that. The one thing that showed correlation was a question that they just added at the end, which was, what browser do you use? And it turns out the people that used Firefox or Chrome were like 17% more likely to stay in the job and also perform better. The reason for that is that if you use Chrome or Firefox, you have not accepted the default on your computer. You have gone out of your way to find something better. And that is the measurement of grit that you can use. Another question is pretty random, but trust me, this one is also um, very useful. So you look at this picture, it's a London underground, on the platform, it's an elephant. What would you do if you saw this elephant? So, the interesting thing about this question is that you will immediately have thoughts. The kind of like thinking that you will have is interesting to me. So basically, it kind of divides into two very specific forks. Like one big group and pretty much everyone in the outreach and creative team has answered, I would take a picture of, picture of it, sit on it, fly it, because they think that's obviously true. Um, and uh, and um, Instagram, uh, Facebook here, and all those kind of things. While the other group, and pretty much all the tech SEOs, the developers, went straight into risk assessment. And, oh, hang on, how did it get there? What are we gonna do about it? Oh, I need to call the zoo. One guy even went so far as saying, hang on, is it true that elephants are scared of mice? And they lose some mice on the underground? <laughs> That's seriously kind of analytical. The point of these kind of questions is not that they're right or wrong but it's a way of figuring out how people think. And what I really want is people that can stretch. People that have maybe already stretched themselves or have been stretched. Sometimes you're stretched by experiences and therefore you are, you are more likely to be able to persevere because you have already been through stuff. Or like Alex, you made yourself go through something because you really wanted it. And then, when you have these people, and I know loads of you already have this grit, the most important thing of getting successful outreach is to encourage people 
to be more of who they are, not to be someone else. There's no one shape and no one way of doing things. And we are really missing out on a lot of things when we are, we are I think the world is so pro um, extroverts. It's like whoever shouts the loudest get heard. But some of the best creative that's been created at Verve has been by the quietest voice in the room. And as managers, as leaders, as co-workers, we need to really open up to listen differently, depending on who we talk to. One of our most successful campaigns to date, um, Idioms of the World and the campaign I shared with the uh, vintage poster, was created by a guy at Verve called Matt, who is really shy and really quiet. But when he comes to me and says, I really want to do this, it's like someone else shouting it. That's what I mean with listen differently. And if you can encourage people to know that it's okay whoever they are and that they can find their own way of doing it, that's when you really say, see results. That is really just our secret. It is letting people find their own way of writing those emails. We give them all the same tools, but everyone has their own way of doing it. Some send loads of emails, some send very few emails and they research everything. They're just very, very different. We basically just need to find our own way. And I cannot stress just how much of an impact this will make. I'm just going to share uh, one more story. So it's this paradox called the monkey ladder um, paradox, um, which had five monkeys in a room uh, and a ladder and some bananas on top of the ladder. Every time a, a monkey tried to go and get the bananas, uh, the scientists will spray them with water. And they would do this repeatedly until they stopped going to the bananas. Then they would change one monkey with a completely new monkey. And as that new monkey went straight for the bananas, the other monkeys tore it down and started beating it up because they didn't want to be sprayed with water. Then they changed another monkey. And now this is the interesting thing. What happened was that the monkey that had just been replaced just before, who had never been sprayed with water, then helped the others tear down the monkey and beat it up. Eventually, they had five new monkeys that had never been sprayed with water, and they went nowhere near the bananas. You are not a monkey. <laughs> you do not need to take on any of these beliefs. I think this is the, the biggest secret to most people's success, is that it doesn't matter if everyone in here say that I can't do this. If I think I can, I will. And if you can teach people how to do that and how to believe in themselves, they will get the results. The key to outreach is basically perseverance and being more of who you are. Whether you are extrovert or introvert, whether you take a long time doing it or, or you are very quick. Basically, as SEOs and content marketers, we need to be professional labyrinth walkers. When we come to a dead end, we find another way. And that's how I managed to get from this to this. Thank you.